I have the good pleasure of introducing Michael Samas. He is John J. Alum, <laughs> class of 2011. I wouldn't be able to tell. He looks so fabulously young. He has great work-life balance. And he graduated with summa cum laude. He has done undergraduate research. He had been promoted at Catchpoint about a year and four months ago. He's very humble. I had the good pleasure of speaking with him to prepare for today's event. And with that being said, Michael, I'm going to give you the floor to talk about yourself. Welcome. Thank you so much. A uh, very flattering introduction. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Mike Salmas. I went to John Jay. I uh, graduated in 2011. Um, you know, studied the computer information sy uh, systems major uh, with a minor in English. Um, my first job out of school was at uh, Catchpoint where um, it was just as a junior test engineer. So I worked there for about uh, two years and um, it was a great experience. It was my first like real job in that, in that field. And um, part of what helped me, uh, I feel, get into that job was um, there were some really good programs in place in John Jay. Like I, um, I was part of the um, Department, of, Department of Homeland Security Career Development Program where they selected four students from John Jay and kind of put, this, put um, them on this path where uh, we were able to work under a mentor and do some research. Uh, so I worked with uh, Professor Khan on that. And then um, in addition, there was um, uh, two required internships that I had to do as well in the summer. And then uh, that gave me experience where I got to work in the Queens District Attorney's Office, uh, working with the cybercrime uh, unit over there for about 10 weeks. And then I did a second internship at Rutgers University uh, with the uh, Dimax program. So um, uh, that that and then also the research I was doing definitely helped, and of course there was um, there were other other perks in that program like uh, you know uh, uh, stipends and uh, and you know tuition coverage as well, which was extremely helpful for me. Um, definitely for uh, you know it's good to be able to graduate and not have uh, have debt student debt. So um, I'm definitely very grateful for that program at John Jay. Um, but yeah, that, I think all those like that kind of practical experience really helped me get that first job. Um, you know, I graduated in, uh, you know, around June or May or June, and then my first job, I got it around November. So, um, you know, and I did take, you know, I took some time to at least travel a little bit before, uh, you know, looking for a, a first job. I definitely recommend that if you have the means, if, uh, you know, if there's somewhere you want to travel to, like when you graduate and right between graduating and starting that new job, that's a really great time where you can kind of go to a place that you've never been to before or uh, explore something new. Um, so yeah, I, I was at Catchpoint for about two years, and um, after um, you know after working there two years, I was hired as a junior uh, test engineer. But I kind of felt like I was at that next level of being like a mid-level uh, software test engineer. And um, I remember having the conversation with my manager at the time, and um, at the time it just didn't work out. Like they they thought like you know I I, I made my case for being mid-level, and then my manager said, oh sorry, I think you're more uh, uh, you know junior level. So um, Long story short, that uh, made me just decide to apply for another job. And I quickly got a job at eMarketer, which is now part of uh, Business Insider. Worked there for about five years total. Um, three of those years, I was doing, uh, I was a mid-level uh, test engineer. And then uh, finally, I was approached by my manager and they asked, you know, instead of being the guy who writes code to test the software, why don't you be the guy who actually writes the software? Uh, so that was a really great opportunity. It allowed me to transition from being a software test engineer to a software engineer um and that now i went to now i've like built applications um uh, for for eMarketer and then um the funny thing is when i left catchpoint the first time i kind of did in a way where i didn't burn the bridge you know i you know I, I highly recommend everyone like always be cordial um you know even if things aren't really a match currently uh you just never know down the road how things could change so um in my case the manager that uh kind of um, didn't accept my uh, my proposal at Catchpoint. She had left the company completely. So uh, Catchpoint reached out to me like, hey, like, you know, how would you like to come back? Like the company's changed a lot in the last five years since you've been here. Uh, so I, you know, I interviewed back there again, the whole, you know, I, I, when I left Catchpoint, it was a startup. It was only about, um, I, w I was like the second employee they hired and then they had grown to 15 employees in two years. And then I had left. Coming back, it went to 300 employees. So that's how much it grew in five years. So um, definitely, you never know. Like I said, like um, with startups too, like there's always risk involved um, for sure. Um, you know, when I first started there, like, you know, being a very small company, you don't have those same benefits like a 401k 
or um, some other perks that are that are quite important as you as you get older. Um, so, you know, how the, those kind of risks, it's good to take it while you're young, I'd say for sure. Um, so yeah, ever since then, well, I've, I've been in Catch Point the last four years. And during that time, I've been promoted from uh, being a mid-level software engineer to now I'm a senior software engineer. And I lead a team uh, consisting of uh, three other software engineers and they vary in level, one senior, uh, one's junior, one's mid-level, and then uh, test engineers as well. And also a product manager. So they're all kind of um, un under uh, under this little umbrella that I work in, and we just you know bang out different features and uh, new and interesting problems that we're solving for the company. Yeah, that's just kind of in a nutshell, <laughs> a very uh, big summary. I'm happy to you know uh, if there's any specific questions you have, Rosie, or the audience. I'm definitely happy to dive, dive deeper. Sure thing. Thank you so much, Michael, for sharing your trajectory and journey thus far. And one of the great uh, qualities of several qualities he has is you have, Michael, is you're very humble, very humble. I hear it in your voice and so forth. And that's such a great character to stick to have. I love how you talked about, right, how to maintain those good relationships, even if things didn't quite turn out as one had expected, right? But relationships are valuable. And I love that they they wanted you back. They're like, you know what? They see great things in you. And so audience, you have the opportunity to post your questions in the chat. You can unmute and ask. And I always say, you know what? Any question is fine. Any question is fine. I'm here to moderate, facilitate. Um, and we have Vince. Hi, Vince. Please feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. What is your question? Hi, Michael. Uh, thanks for doing this session. So I'm also an incoming software engineer after my graduation. And I also got it from, you know, John Jay programs. Uh, my question is, what would you advise to new grad engineers, especially if they're just starting out on the career? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I think one of the biggest challenges that everyone comes uh, has right when they, you know, when they graduate is choosing what stack you want to focus on. So uh, for example, some some people um, excel in doing client side engineering, meaning like JavaScript, uh, React JS is very hot and coming up, um, or like CSS, even just HTML, PHP. Um, some people really excel in that track, and maybe they have an eye for like uh, for design and everything, and making sure um, that you know the the website is aesthetically pleasing that they're working on. Uh, some people have the trajectory where they want to work on mobile applications, and that's that's a whole another different language path you can explore there. And then uh, the, you have backend engineering, which is like C++, Java, C Sharp, and that's just like doing the number crunching, maybe interacting with databases and things like that. Um, and then you like you have what I did, which is like test engineering, which is like you're writing automated scripts using uh, C Sharp and like a tool like Selenium, which will interact with the browser and automate cert certain actions, like filling out a form, hitting the submit button, verifying that uh, you get a success message that shows up in the browser or something like that. So um, figuring that out is kind of hard in the beginning. I would say definitely when you when you graduate, just like um, you know, look at what's out there, um, see what the demand is. It's, it it does change quite a bit over the you know uh, right now. Like for example, AI is a very hot topic now, although you know the engineering on that is very much in its infancy stage. Um, but I would say like you know, figure out what your what your passion is, whether it's like, you know, some people don't uh, have patience for like the client side and like JavaScript and stuff like that, like too, too many, you know, that pixel perfect thing you have to do is just can be too tedious for people, while other people love it. So, um, you know, just, um, but, you know, definitely try to learn other languages as well in programming, like don't, don't just stick to the one you're taught in school. Um, for example, like even though like C++ was taught very heavily when I was in John Jay, um, when I was working under um, a uh, Professor Khan, I was learning Python. I also learned PHP during that time as well. So definitely branch out, try to learn different things. There's a lot of free resources, um, even if you can't find it within John Jay, like um, just on YouTube, you can learn. I mean, I was using YouTube to learn uh, calculus back in my college days. So there's definitely plenty of resources for, uh, for learning other languages. So yeah, I would say just play around with other languages. The beauty of it is once you know one programming language, it's very easy to pick up others. Um, there's kind of like a set formula to it, really. So, um, yeah, explore that. And I think that'll, that'll help you get on the right track. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. 
So Mike, question for you. What are some resources that you suggest to people? What are your go-tos, right? Whether it's learning a new skill, new programming language. Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely, um, you know, there's a Stack Overflow has some really good resources. I know probably a lot of the students here are familiar with it because uh, it's a typical place you go to first when you have a, a question related to like, why isn't this, why, why isn't the program I'm running working? Um, they put out a great um, yearly report that kind of breaks down everything in terms of like, what are the most popular languages? What are the languages that, um, like it even gives you breakdowns of like even like software engineer salaries across the US versus the rest of the world. Um, and the type of um, the type of uh, skills that there uh, people are looking for in different industries. So um, definitely recommend looking at those kind of reports. Um, there's another website uh, called Leet Code, L E E T Code uh, dot com. That one is really good with giving programming exercises. So um, and it's a free resource. There is a paid subscription version, but the idea of that one is um, it, it's basically a database of hundreds of questions that vary from like computer algorithms to data structures. And, um, re, you know, some of the, some of the big top uh, tech companies such as uh, Google and Microsoft, they actually use problems from Leap, uh, Leap code when it comes to their interviewing process. So, um, and they categorize the questions by easy to hard. And uh, there's even explanations. You can get explanations from either Leap code themselves or from other people trying to solve the problems. And every day they, they create a new problem and you know everyone, the community comes together and tries to solve it. Um, I typically do it when, um, if I'm like between, if I'm like trying to look for another job or something like that, it's really a great way to brush up on your skills and you know um, make sure you're studying for what the industry is looking for. Those are some really great resources. So you had talked about Leet Code and you had talked about Stack Over Report. Do I have that right? Uh, uh, Stack Overflow. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Yeah. And then of course, YouTube also has some great tutorials too. If you just type in like Python tutorials, there's, there's a lot of free ones out there, like people just kind of teaching it. Um, so it's, it's great. Thank you for that. And we have a question in the chat here. Before I say your name, please forgive me in advance. It's a very beautiful name. I don't have the phonetics to pronounce it correctly. So feel free to correct me. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Aise Tonkara, and I, I just love the energy, says, hi, beautiful people. My question is, how can one make that switch from liberal arts to a software engineering career? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, even me, myself, actually, at John Jay, I didn't, I wasn't sure that I wanted to be, a, like, when I, my first major going into John Jay was actually uh, legal studies. I was planning to be a paralegal. Um, so my first, uh, the good thing about, you know, being at a four-year school is like that first two years was all like electives and things like that. So during that process, like I, there was, um, you know, when I was looking for electives to take, I think I was in the end of my freshman year, I decided, I was like, you know what, I always had a niche, I, I love a passion for like computers. Like I'm definitely been a, a gamer growing up and, um, you know, just was always using the internet for, <laughs> for, you know, trying to like teach myself different things. So like, I was like, you know, let me just take like an intro to programming 101 class and uh, I did it. And just by taking that as an elective, I just fell in love with the programming world and software development in general. Um, so I would say the, the first step would be just, you know, uh, you need to just take a class on it, you know, just as an elective, worst case scenario, even if you end up taking it and you realize it's not a match or something like that, at least it's just, you know, one elective, it still counts towards something. So, um, you know, it's, I would say just, you know, taking a class if, if um, you know, if, if if it's like um uh, like you you need like you want to do like as a free resource instead of you know going uh doing it directly through like a college credit definitely check out some youtube videos like um you know some i would say like uh, one of the programming languages with the easiest learning curves is python for sure so just taking like a a basic course on python on on youtube uh just to kind of see what what you're getting yourself into and then um i mean that's going to give you just some, you know, some basic understanding. I don't think learning through YouTube is a way to like, you know, do it, do, do it 100% like that and then get a job like in <laughs> at, at, um, at a software company, but it's a great start. It's a great way to just familiarize yourself with it. And then when you're ready to take that next step, then you would take like um, a, a course at John Jay or, or, or any school and then, um, you know, switch your major over if you really like it. That's, that's what I did. So. 
I love that exploratory journey that you have. And thank you for that. I would, so our next question is in the chat as well from Ozan Sert. Hello, my name is Ozan. What kind of project, Michael, would you recommend doing for a resume? Did you have any experience before you got your first job? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, during my internships, I was able to kind of work on some side projects. Um, there were two that I worked on. Um, you know, one of them had to do with, uh, it was, you know, it was, I, that uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security Career Development Program had a requirement that I do research. So um, in that, in, in that project, I did something where it had to do with um, uh, getting like, getting network traffic and then trying to detect anomalies or like some kind of like if there was a DDoS attack or something like that happening. And then uh, when that was occurring, it would play a musical note, the, the program. So it was like kind of being able to hear if something was occurring, like that was wrong on your network. Um, so that was definitely a really good project. Um, another one I worked on was um, had to do with using like a Twitter API to like get tweets and then be able to kind of graph out uh, how people are retweeting um, like a certain tweet and just seeing like, you know, following like a hashtag, for example, and then just like being able to chart out like, okay, like this person tweeted it and then this person retweeted, like being able to draw a whole graph of that. Um, that was kind of a cool project as well. I would say, um, you know, it doesn't have to be that complex. So, I mean, these are things that like one of them was 10 weeks in the making. One of them was uh, two years in the making. So um, if you want something simple to start out, just, you know, create a GitHub uh, account and um, you know that way you can like upload your own code in there and start with little things like uh, let's say you wanted to focus on the client side and like JavaScript um, using JavaScript write a um, write your own version of a dropdown like instead of using like the one that HTML provides like actually write out a dropdown um, it could be as simple as that it could be uh, creating a form you know and just having that on your GitHub um, another thing you can do is look at uh, you know the open source community has a lot of like of uh, great and interesting projects. There's a lot of cool APIs out there that you can say, you know, I want to write a program that, you know, takes the data from this API and then, you know, is able to spit out an Excel spreadsheet or, um, or uh, draw a chart or something like that. So um, definitely explore what's out there in the open source world and try to, you don't necessarily have to build things from scratch. You can take two or three multiple or multiple open source um, projects and kind of integrate them all together into your own project. And, um, that's something that builds up, you know, when a um, when you're whether you're looking for a new job or you're talking to a recruiter, um, them seeing that is always very impressive. Like we, I, I remember uh, there was an engineer I worked with that um, he was he got a job at Spotify actually, and he did this whole like website on like Spotify, like his own like, you know, using it like using their API, doing some kind of cool integration with them, and they were very impressed with that, and like that was part of like a big factor why they hired him. So. Um, you know, definitely those are some ideas there. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You did some undergraduate research here while you are at John Jay. How did you get involved with that experience? And I remember you also said you worked on a project for my program for PRISM, which is so dope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so that, I mean, a lot of that came from the Department of Homeland Security Career Development Program, but uh, how I got affiliated with PRISM was um, while I was working on that project with uh, Professor Khan, um, he had mentioned uh, that there was a need for the PRISM program where they wanted a website where students can upload their, um, you know, be able to apply for the program. And then there was a way through that website where, um, you know, professors can review applications within that program and uh, be able to like, you know, categorize the applications and accept or reject them, things like that. Or, or review them. So we, um, you know, the opportunity came to myself and another student and we actually were able to build this whole thing out for, for the PRISM program. So the, the um, I guess the lesson learned there is like, look for opportunities within your school. There's some, sometimes there's, there's things like that where like there's a program at the school that like needs, you know, they, they need a software engineer to do something or someone even just studying it. And there's, there's opportunities there. Um, so always see what's available in, in your department, I'd say. Great. Those are all, all awesome things. Thank you, Michael. All right. So from Kevin Satria in the chat, 
Hi, Mike. Before finding a job, did you already have a specific field in mind or did you explore first and found out what you liked? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for me, uh, it, I kind of just fell into that place. Like I was, when I graduated, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do in terms of like which field I wanted to focus on, uh, whether it was client side or server side or, or the testing route. I was just applying for anything in the software test engineering, in the software field. And um, that was junior level because, you know, that I was just fresh out of college. So um, doing that, like I just, I did interview at some other companies and like some of them were for client side, some of them were service side, some were both. Um, I just happened to fall into the testing uh, engineering route and I ended up loving it. Um, I know it doesn't work that way for everybody. Um, you know, if, if there is a specific area you want to explore, like definitely just apply for for uh, for jobs in that field. But me personally, I didn't have a specific field in mind. I just wanted anything to get just to, to get the experience on my resume, basically. So I I, I, I would say like don't necessarily like if you have been searching for a while, then you get like an offer, even if it's not 100 percent what you want to do. Like, let's say you want you wanted more client side, but you got a, um, a testing test engineering job or a server side job. It's okay to take it. I mean, um, you know, if the worst case scenario, take it for a year just so you have that experience under your belt. And it's going to be so much easier when you do want that second, that other job. Uh, because I think the hardest part of, in the software engineering field is like getting that first job. But once you get that first job, it's we, it's really easy to get another job. Like I, I get LinkedIn emails um, from recruiters probably uh to, uh, two to three times a week of like opportunities like <laughs> that there are like other companies that are like aggressively hiring and I turn them down because I'm just happy where I'm at and I think all of you like software engineering is a very hot field right now there's a lot of demand for it so um, you know definitely uh, you, you there's no shortage of jobs there <laughs> at, at the time so glad to hear that no shortage of jobs there isn't anything in the chat at the moment. Oh, wait, just popped up from Kevin Satria. If you had to go back to school on a fresh start, what are the most important things you would do or what would you have done differently? Um, let's see. So uh, I, I kind of wish I focused a little bit more on math, I would say. Um, to be honest, like math wasn't my strongest suit. Um, I personally did a, um, like I did a, I did the major in computer information systems and I minored in English. I think the minor in English, I, I don't regret that at all because that's like a really good skill. One, one thing I think a lot of people notice is in the software engineering field, um, you're dealing with people usually from like all over the world. Um, I think especially now like post COVID, like that's usually the trend. Like now we hire globally, like even my company. Um, sometimes you're working with people that, that, you know, English isn't, is, isn't their first language. And I think having the communication skills, um, is a big advantage because there's a, I, throughout my career, I, I've met a lot of really, uh, great engineers, but then they, they're not good communicators. Like if you like, they're they're if you give them a problem, they can solve it very quickly. But if you ask them to explain what they did to like someone like a product manager, someone who doesn't understand code, they have a really difficult time. So I think having an having like a, like an English major could be an advantage because you'll have that, that edge of being able to communicate your thoughts and uh, what's going on in the program very thoroughly and clearly. Um, but I, yeah, going back to, to the question, I think um, like a definitely a little stronger focus on math, I think would have, would have helped me a, a little bit. Um, so like if, you know, if you have the means to say do a minor in math, I know there's, there are quite a few math courses in the, computer science curriculum itself. I think it's just a matter of maybe taking, at the time when I went, it was like maybe a matter of me taking like two more courses, I would have had a math minor. Uh, but that's that's a very minor regret, honestly. Um, overall, I'm, I'm very happy with my experience at John Jay and I'm extremely grateful for the opportunities I had there uh, because honestly, I wouldn't have the job uh, that I have right now uh, if it wasn't for, for uh, the mentorship and, and everything that I had at John Jay. Thank you for your question, Kevin. Your questions, I should say. So, Michael, you had talked about that you supervise about at least two to three people. How did you develop your supervisory style? And what are some of the nuggets of wisdom that you've learned along the way? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
So yeah, it, it the the role kind of came about uh, because I like I mentioned before, communication and being able to articulate yourself. I think that is something um, you know companies are looking for in software developers, and typically people who have good communication skills. Um, it's much easier for them to end up in this leadership supervisory kind of roles. Um, so just being able to delegate is a very important skill to have. I think one challenge I had in the beginning is as a software engineer, you want to like, you know, if you're given, if you see like a bug in an application, like you want to be the guy that goes in there and fixes it. Um, but when you're, when you're a lead software engineer, you have to kind of pause and then look at the big picture because, um, if you're so focused in the, you know, in the trenches of the code and everything like that, you can't lead the team. So um, one thing I've had to balance out is like, you know, my days used to consist of, you know, 90% coding, 10% dealing with people. Now I would say it's more like 30% coding and, and uh, you know, 70% uh, dealing with people, whether it's um, the engineers within my team, whether it's external, um, you know, people outside my company, like, uh, like stakeholders or clients or dealing with um, executives within my company. So there's, um, if you are, you know, there's, there's kind of two paths you can take in software engineering, I would say like, um, there's one path of like, you know, start off junior, junior test engineer, mid-level test engineer, senior test engineer, then getting into the more managerial route uh, where it's, you, you're coding a lot less, but then you're managing software engineers and you have, you have a very good understanding of the system, which, uh, you know, people from other departments depend on you for that. And then you have another track you can go down, which is just once you get to that senior software engineer role, just staying in that senior software engineer. Like I work with people that like they have, they want nothing to do with managing people. They're like, I love coding and this is what I do. And um, that's their niche. And they just focus on that. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's people that go the engineering route, engineering manager route, and people who just strictly stay in the engineering route. Um, that's something that you'll, you'll um, kind of, figure that out over time. Um, because like I said, everyone's different. Uh, me, I'm, I'm starting to trend more towards the managerial route. I'm not a manager currently, but that's kind of the path I'm, I'm taking in my career. But I know plenty of people who just stick to the engineering route and they're doing um, just as well, if not better. <laughs> Michael, um, my limited Mandarin for thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And so I'm going to confess, there's going to be some times I may interject with some talking. I want to give Michael uh, a chance to breathe, to get some water, everyone. No problem. Excellent. So we have another question from Aise in the chat. What is the typical salary starting range for someone who's beginning in software engineering? Yep. So I'm a little out of touch with this because um, <laughs> I've, uh, you know, my first my first job was in 2011. Um, so I I'm sure the starting salaries have changed quite a bit since then. At the time, my first job, it was uh, it was fifty thousand a year. Uh, that was the starting salary. But I I would imagine it's increased quite a bit since then. I would say it's probably more in the range of of uh, seventy to seventy five. I would say maybe uh, starting starting out. Uh, yeah, but it's it's uh, one of those things that um, you know what. It's it's a very high paying career, which is good. I think um, you know it's definitely like um, a great route to go. And you know, depending which um, you know, one one thing like there's like a very big extremes. Like for example, like a starting salary of like if you wanted to get into Google is much higher than if you were to get into say a um, a real estate company as a software engineer. So that, that is another factor too, what company you're working for or, or what kind of companies you're targeting. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is like, if you're going for these bigger companies like Google, Microsoft, Meta, um, there is a lot of, um, you know, there's there's pros and cons to anything, everything. I, I mean, I haven't worked in at companies at that scale, um, although I, I have worked with people who, who do work at those companies. And, um, you know, there's pros and cons to it. There's, um, you know, for, for example, um, uh, for Amazon specifically, like I heard some horror stories of some people I know who've worked for Amazon and they just had no life there. They just were working like, like um, crazy hours, high stress um, and, you know, being like constant monitoring and things like that. And it's just like very, like they did it just to like kind of make a lot of, they made a lot of money, which is nice, but they just had like no social life at all. It was just like very strict to work. 
and they did it for like a year or two and then they left and then they were able to find you know get a job at a somewhere that paid less but then they had a lot less stress in their life so but then I also know people who work from for uh, Google and Meta and they actually have a very good work-life balance so um, that's one factor I would say to look for um, when you're when you're applying for sure. Grazie, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> what drew you to Catchpoint and what are some of the strengths of your company? Sure. So um, Catchpoint, like what I liked about it is, um, you know, I was I'm always grateful because they're the first job I got out of school, but um, they are a you know, at the time they were a startup, they were just a software, they, they were basically, it was founded by four people who used to work for DoubleClick and DoubleClick was a acquired by Google. And then, so they were essentially Google employees. DoubleClick is basically, when you, whenever you go on a website and you see ads on it, like you, <laughs> you go to CNN.com and you see an ad, you can thank, uh, <laughs> you can thank DoubleClick for that. It's basically like, they were one of the, the founders of like putting ads on the internet. So, um, you know, they they basically saw a problem in their space where um, there weren't a lot of solutions for like um, website performance monitoring, making sure that a website is like up and running properly. And um, they decided to like leave Google and take the big risk of starting their own company to address that problem. And, um, you know, when I started with them, it was very small, but everybody was like very humble, like so helpful and like in, in uh, training me and like teaching me what I know today. So um, I'll always be grateful for that. Um, you know, they had a very good, a great work culture and, uh, you know, kind of a work hard, play hard mentality, which was really good. Um, and we still uh, have that even to this day. Like, um, you know, when during the pandemic, when things were really, uh, were really crazy in terms of like, you know, going from going to office every day to working from home, um, they were, the company was so helpful and, and accommodating to everyone, making sure that everyone had what they need. We had like a, um, a stipend for, uh, making sure that, uh, we, we had like all the office supplies we need, like, let's say, you know, get us a more comfortable computer chair or, <laughs> or a wireless headset or something like that. So, um, you want to look for companies like that for sure. Like a company that is just going to, um, really, really embrace their employees and, and, um, you know, uh, treat them with, with dignity and respect. And, and that's also going to, you know, help you build your career as well. No, that's awesome to hear. A company that takes care of their employees, values them, nurtures them, looks out for them. All great things. And so the next question comes from one of my favorite people here at John Jay College. She is the Director of Alumni Engagement, Ms. Roseanne Santel. She is so phenomenal. And she oversees many things, including the Alumni Mentorship Program. So her question in the chat is, so Michael, are there impactful ways that alumni like you would like to engage further with students and John Jay College? For example, an event like this one, what else potentially? Yeah, absolutely. So this is actually my second time speaking uh, to, to uh, students at John Jay. I did a similar event uh, last year and uh, which I, I really enjoyed. I mean, I, I, I think one thing that everyone should look forward to is giving back, like when, when you, once you're, uh, once you finish uh, your school days, like definitely don't, you know, you'll still have those connections back in John Jay and, and or, or whichever CUNY school you're in and, um, you know, be able to, you know, always, always have that door open. Like I said, um, I'm always looking for other ways I can, you know, keep, you know, keep in touch with, um, you know, different uh, events here and everything like that. For example, um, I've encouraged my company to do like, uh, we, we do have a summer internship program that we do uh, every, every year. So, um, you know, I've, I've told my company like, Hey, let's, let's set up a table with, uh, with CUNY or John Jay. Um, we didn't, we didn't get the, obviously that's been kind of put on a hold with the pandemic, you know, the last few years, but I think it is something that we may evaluate perhaps this year or next year. So, um, definitely those kind of things. Um, yeah, besides speaking events and, um, um, and also like those kind of, um, job pro job, uh, programs, Another one I did was um, I did like there's a CUNY tech uh, prep program and I did some work there where, um, you know, I did mock interviews with students where they would uh, come to me. I pretended to, I was like a representative of a, of a company and I would say I would ask some real questions that I got asked when I was looking for a job because I, I also interview people. I've been doing it since uh, since uh, my days at eMarketer. So um, 
I, I would kind of do the mock interview with them. I would give advice at the end. I would say like, okay, you did great in this, but you know, maybe try to mention this next time or, or leave this out. And um, you know, just try to give students the realistic expectation of what to, you know, what's going to happen when they uh, when they're looking for that first job. So those are that's another great way to to give back as well. Thank you. Thank you. So Michael and I got to chat in preparing for this talk, and he that's on one of his New Year's resolutions for 2023 about looking at ways to give back. And so I just want to give um, an extra boost of a plug to our alumni mentorship program. And Michael is <laughs> have been informally to formally recruited in terms of connecting one-on-one um, -on -one monthly with a potential John Jay student, a current John Jay student. And Roseanne's been doing this. I mean, she's like a ninja at this. Roseanne, feel free if you want to like put in the chat or speak, you know, on that a bit. I'll give you the floor if you like. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Michael. Nice to meet you and nice to meet everyone on the call. The alumni mentorship program is really just that. We match alumni like Michael who want to be part of the program with a student based on the industry you want to be in or if you want to learn a certain skill. Most of the students who apply for the program want to meet someone who's in the career that they want to be in. And so I do my best to kind of match you up with someone. It's only a semester long. It's virtual. You don't have to meet in person unless you want to. And we only ask one to two hours a month. So, I mean, if you want to do more with your mentor, mentee, that's fantastic. But we want to keep the program manageable for both the mentor and the mentee. And we know how busy everyone is. I'm going to put my email in the chat if you have any questions as a student or Michael, maybe um, Rosie can put you in touch with me if you if you're truly interested, no pressure. Um, I can give you more information. Thank you so much for letting me share that. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure for certain. And we definitely want to get the word out to our John Jay alumni, as well as to our current students. And right, I love the attitude of giving back. How can we mentor others? How can we encourage others, affirm them, share our experiences, right? To all of you guys who are attending here, right? You're sewing into that vision, which I appreciate. And we got a couple of questions in the chat um, with Roseanne Santos's email. It is in the chat. I will also send an email out to those who registered, those who registered but couldn't attend. So you guys will have that information as well. And let me just, oh, we got a lot of questions. It's good stuff. All right. So next one is Anthony Mendez. He asks, do you recommend coding boot camps, Michael? So yeah, it's um it's definitely helpful. I would say um, you know, there there's some good good programs out there from like uh Udacity and uh, uh Udemy. They put together some um I don't know if I'd call them like necessarily boot camp, but like courses that you can take. Um you know, I actually, I actually taught a course with Udacity um, on React JS development. So um, that's, you know, there's, there's a lot of like, kind of like, they call it like a nano degree or something that where you can like, kind of take like, a, if there's a specific skill set you want to focus on, um, there's definitely nothing wrong with, with taking something like that. Um, I would say, um, try to, try to look more for like the free to like, uh, you know, always make sure there's, there isn't like a free resource available already, I would say, because there's a lot of, coding boot camps out there, but honestly, all they do is just copy paste what's free on the internet and like, you know, then sell it as their own course and say like, this is the way, you know? So um, there's, I can't emphasize enough how many free resources are out there. Uh, if you truly want to learn like, you know, some kind of specific skill set. Um, so yeah, like I, I think there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it might be a good, I think one advantage with coding boot camps is like they, they typically give you an assignment or like a big project you need to do by the end of it. And I think that is, if you need that kind of structure, that can definitely um, kind of help you rather, rather than like, you know, say watching a bunch of YouTube videos or using W3 schools. And then, um, you know, after that, trying to figure out what you're going to build now that you know those skills. So um, I, I think there's, yeah, I have nothing against them at all. I think they're definitely a valid um, uh, use. Okay, so we're about almost 30 people. Um... And we have 
about three four more questions in the chat. We're at 228, just keeping some time here. Anyone who doesn't get a question in, right, I'll leave my contact information and get it over to Michael. And everyone will have access to the recording as well and where you can locate it. All right. Got a lot of exciting things going on in this chat. Bear patiently with me. I'm trying to find the next person who had a question just to do in proper order. And we still have people coming in, which is great. They want to get in on this, get some nuggets of wisdom here and there. So the next question is from Denzel Garnett. What would you do, Michael, if you are trying to land an internship in your freshman year? Yeah, freshman year is, um, that's that's a, it's a good question. It's, it's tricky. Like I'd, I'd say, you know, the first thing to ask is be like, you know, um, like freshman year, do you already, do you already have something that you can code in? Because it is tricky to like, in, like um, even like the internships, like we do, honestly, it's typically someone that's in junior or senior um, in their, in their, in their studies. Um, we typically don't hire and I haven't seen many companies that hire someone that's like freshman. Um, but you know, the, like it, you can, it's not that there's no internships at all, but like, they might not be having you program. It might be more like data entry or something along those lines. So, um, I would say, um, it's a, it's a little tricky to get a, a, um, a paid internship and in, like, or, or I guess an un unpaid might be possible, but paid is a little, a little tricky because it's just like, unless you already have some coding skills already that, you know, before going into it, then maybe you'll, you'll be at a, a, a decent advantage there. But yeah, I would say, unfortunately, it tends to be more junior, senior level um, that, that, uh, that get internships out of school. I really like the ambition, Denzel, right? You'll be like, hey, this is where I'm at. How can I get started? So great questions here. Uh, yeah, I just want to add just, um, I would say definitely look at the school first for any res resources. There's a lot of, sometimes you can find a, a paid or unpaid internship opportunity within within CUNY perhaps, or just even working under, um, finding, finding a professor that you can work under mentorship um, is another kind of great resource like I did. Um, maybe there's like a side project you can work on with, with that professor in order to gain more experience. Sure thing. And so I'm going to put a plug in for my co-collaborator co for this Career Chat Connection series, CCPDR Career Center. We're having next month in person, March 15th. I believe that's a Wednesday, March 15th, a career internship fair. So polish up those resumes. Definitely get your pitches ready for your elevator pitch. I would say also, right, as Michael said, talking to your professors. They all have office hours. And I know some students are like, I don't know what to say. What if I ask something stupid, right? Okay, let's let's try to go a little basic here <laughs> with getting to know your professors. Visit them during their office hours. Introduce yourself, right? Talk about what you're curious about, what you want to learn. Or if you, you're you not ready with that, just to ask the professor, right? How did they know this is what they wanted to do? Where did they go to school? How did they come to teach at John Jay? And that can help break the ice a bit. And the next question we have here from Kevin Satria. Michael, can you give us an insight of some of the tasks that you're given in your job? Sure. So um, as the lead software engineer at my job, uh, my day consists of usually there's like a morning meeting just to, um, you know, make sure everyone knows what they're doing for the day. Like, you know, like what, what you worked on yesterday and what you're working on today and if you're blocked on anything. So I just check in with all the engineers uh, to see, make sure they're on, on track for delivering the features that we promised to the product manager. Um, I also need to check with testers, see were there any, our, our testers are actually based in India. So they're typically filing or filing bugs that they might find overnight. So when I wake up in the morning, I just check my email right away and I'll see like, maybe they found like two bugs overnight. Um, and sometimes they're, you know, I have to look at them and I have to see, okay, is this a valid bug or is this not a bug? Um, so, you know, there's some time spent with that, checking in with the testers, see if what kind of bugs they found. And then if it's a, how serious is the bug too? Let's say, that, you know, is it something that's like critical and we need to stop what we're doing and address this bug? Or is it something that's like really minor and it can wait, you know, uh, a month or something like that. So um, definitely a lot of that. There's also uh, planning, like we, 
my company, we do, we basically do a, so, uh, a release where we add new features to our software uh, six times a year. So that's about every six weeks we're doing a, uh, a release. So, uh, and every release there is something we have to bring to the table in terms of like, you know, what, what we're uh, delivering to our clients to give them, you know, new abilities to do new things. So um, some of my days uh, spent planning out the next release, like I'll be working on a current release, but then I also have to think about what's going in the next one. So that might involve meetings with, with product managers, with stakeholders, um, and just making sure that we're all, we all, we're all set with a plan there. So, uh, and then besides that, then uh, there's also real coding that I'm doing as well. Sometimes because my workload is more like on the management, like managing and supervising kind of side, um, I don't code as much as the people, the other people on my team. However, um, I will be able to work on maybe like a smaller thing. Like let's say there's a bug that came in that, you know, it's kind of important. We need to get it in this release. Um, and maybe it's not a really, a, it's not a lot of work. Maybe it'll only take me like a half day to do it. Then I'll just do that so that I can have the rest of my team focus on like the real big uh, features that they're working on for the release. So um, it's, it's um, I would say that's kind of what my, my day consists of. It's kind of a balance between a, a lot of planning and like, um, you know, making sure we're on track for everything and then also doing real development um, and, and like fixing bugs or adding new features. Thank you, Michael. That's really good detail. And okay, so just to summarize in the chat here, I, I really great responses in terms of they want you on LinkedIn. <laughs> Can we connect with you on LinkedIn? And uh, Mike, you're gonna be you're gonna be quite popular over the next few days. <laughs> kind of um, but I love it. Uh, you have such a great openness to connecting and helping others. And yeah, people are asking, how can I be a mentee? Do I reach out to a Ms. Santos? Yes, yes, and yes. We want to get the word out about how amazing the alumni mentorship program is. And we have a series of great questions. Before I ask the series of questions, we're at 2.36. I'm gonna save a couple minutes of time. I'd like to introduce one of my colleagues around 2.40, Lizeth Matos. Or I can introduce her right now. I saw her turn on her camera. So let me do that. So Lizeth Matos is with the CUNY 2X TTP program. She is really phenomenal in so many ways. So I'm going to give her the floor for a bit. Thanks, Lizeth. Thanks, Rosie. So I just wanted to, again, introduce myself. My name is Lizette Matos. You guys can call me Liz. Um, we work with the Tech Talent Pipeline um, that Mayor de Blasio instituted a few years ago. Um, and the program at John Jay is basically, um, you sign up for it. You should be anywhere between a sophomore, like a rising sophomore, all the way to maybe a rising senior, uh, rising junior. Um, and we have a boot camp um, that is currently being uh, developed. Uh, uh, it used to be in the in January for four weeks, very intensive. And then in the summer, we would try to find you an internship. So those of you that are looking to, you know, do an internship and things like that, um, you can definitely sign up for our program. We're currently not recruiting, but we will be sending out an interest form um, to all computer science students that are eligible for the program. So definitely keep an eye out on that. Um, I don't think that Vince is here. Um, Vince was a, a part of our program, and as he said in the beginning, um, he did was able to secure a full-time job um, a few months after he graduates this spring. So um, yeah, so it's great to meet you all. Thank you for being here. Um, and I will also pop my email in the chat just in case anyone is interested in learning more. Thanks, Rosie. You're welcome. Fabulous. I love the connections and the people turning out at John Jay. We've got some mentees that are interested in the program. So, okay, from Orlin Turbio. Hello, Mike, thank you for doing this. I have some questions. One, what are the challenges you encountered throughout your college, your college skills and career? He has two other questions, but let me give you that one first. Challenges? Okay, sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, basically, I, I think, um, I think for me, one of them was was math, like I had mentioned before, and I see that's like kind of a follow up question too. Um, at, during like when I was in high school, um, I was actually not a good math student, which kind of discouraged me in the beginning from studying software, uh, uh, computer programming, because I knew that it was heavy on math. But um, I would say just um, you know the way I kind of overcame that is just like you know I I 
I just like really focused hard on it. I um, I know there's like the um, the uh, tutoring, like what I'm trying to remember, like a tut math tutoring center or something like that at John Jay. I was going there all the time if I didn't understand how to um, how to do something in a class because I was very intimidated by um, by uh, pre calculus and calculus, for example. Uh, but then once I I just after school um, I would just go to that tutoring center and I would just ask, like definitely take advantage of all the resources that the school gives. There's so many that I felt like a lot of students didn't take advantage of, um, even in relation to writing. Like if I had an essay due. I would take it to the writing center and I would like have like someone review it with me and give me constructive feedback on how I can make that essay better. The same thing applies to math. The same thing I'm sure applies to, to computer science as well. I, I remember there was a, um, I, I had a little bit of difficulty learning algorithms and um, the professor uh, I had was so open. She had um, like, in, like office, like after office hours and like uh, she would even volunteer to come in on a weekend, like on a Saturday, like morning. And I remember going in on a Saturday morning and like with some other students and we just wanted to like understand how to do this thing. And uh, we're I'm so incredibly grateful. She, she was so patient with us and really, uh, really cared, you know. Um, so like there's there's resources like that. And, and you'd be just surprised, like just be transparent with your professor. If you're having a hard time understanding a specific concept because computer science is not easy. Um, please reach out to them and like, you know, see what kind of resources they can point you to, or even just give you some tutoring um, afterwards. So um, take advantage of those resources. Absolutely. I'm just going to interject a wee bit. So yes, uh, shout out to the MSRC Math and Science Resource Center, first floor of the new building. So they have supplemental instructors and they have tutors. So supplemental instruction, uh, generally on the upper level, math and science courses and computer science courses, of course. If you're not seeing the support you're looking for, right, always feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email in and you'll see, yeah, you'll see some emails from me after this event. Uh, I would say the next question is from Orlet. What are your suggestions to improve programming skills? Yeah, so um, I would say, you know, programming is one of those things that's constantly changing. For example, you can learn a framework and then in a year from now, that framework is completely different <laughs> or there's like new things you can do in it that you couldn't before. Um, you know, let's say whatever language you end up uh, working on, I would say just, you know, make sure you follow like whoever maintains. So for example, um, I mentioned like React.js, which is a client side JavaScript based framework. Um, that's maintained by, by uh, Meta. So like they are constantly, it's, it's uh, kind of one of the hotter technologies on the client side and uh, they've made a lot of changes. There's always a new version coming out and there's new uh, things you could do with it. Or sometimes they even make, they make mistakes too, where they say like, hey, we realized that we implemented this in a certain way, but that kind of goes against our architecture. So as of version 17, you can no longer do functions like this, you know? So, um, I would say just follow like the who, follow whoever maintains those languages, whether it's like um, you know Meta or it's like Microsoft with like C Sharp or something like that. Um, those are some ways to keep your skills up to date. Always see what kind of new interesting things are coming out with, um, and also practice with it. When you see that, let's say there's a new way of a new way you can do something in C Sharp, and C Sharp is your specialty. Play around with it on your own. Just like try it out. Um, and and just just to get a, a feel for it, but yeah, it's it's it is one of the biggest challenges on the industry is like just keeping your skills up to date. Um, try not to ever be stagnant. Like let's say you're at a job and you've been working with the same technology for over four years. Um, you don't want to be in a situation because I've seen it before where someone's been at a company for ten years and they've only been working on the same language, and then something happens where either the company doesn't do well or that employee gets laid off and then all of a sudden they're 10 years behind everyone else and it's very difficult to find another job at that point so it's something that you know you should look for it in your in your if your job's not supplying that um you might be something where you want to consider getting another job or just or even just taking a class on the side to just keep your skills up to date sure i would say also to that ask Ask what professional development opportunities your employer offers or can connect you to or, right, you can have it discounted. Do they support you going for an advanced degree, a certification, and so forth? 
And our last question as we're at 243 uh, comes from Kevin. What level of math do you need to, to know to be at your current job at the moment, Michael? And how often do you use it? Yeah, so um, I would say, to be honest, I'm not using like a lot of like calculus in my work or anything like that, but um, lately it hasn't been too, I haven't been doing anything too, too crazy just because like I'm, I'm more on the, um, so I'm a full stack developer. I do both client side and server side development. Um, but my expertise is more on the client side, like, you know, React, like I keep mentioning React.js, JavaScript. Um, and in that side, like I'm not really doing too much advanced math, but I do like, if you're working on the server side with like, you know, C sharp is definitely, or Java or C++, like there's definitely like a heavy, uh, you need to have a like, good knowledge of algorithms, like, you know, big O notation is one that definitely is something that comes up a lot um, in software engineering. So make sure you're, uh, you're good on that. Um, yeah, I would say mainly on the algorithmic side, there's quite a bit of math that you use, but other than that, not, not so much crazy stuff with like calculus or anything like that. I haven't really used that personally, but I do see the value of why it's taught in the school, at least because it does give you the skills you need to like solve different problems in, in computer science. Well said. And on that note, this concludes our first Career Chat Connections with Michael Samus, the new software engineer at Catchpoint. I thank you so much for your time, everybody. Such really great questions. And so you'll see a follow-up email from me, um, right? I'll have Lizeth Matos, Roseanne Santos, their contact information, Michael's LinkedIn, and any other things you want to address, you could always feel free to message me. So thank you once again, Michael, and everybody who participated. You will all receive the link access to this recording. And with that, enjoy the sunshine today and have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone. This was a pleasure.